What's up, everyone? Welcome to the BT Podcast. Thanks for taking some time to tune in. My name is Danny. I'm the online pastor here at BT Church, and I am your host uh, and excited about today's conversation. However you're tuning in, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, uh, we pray this conversation is a blessing to you. If this does bless you, do us a favor, share it, tweet about it, post it, let your friends know uh, to check this out. Uh, And so we are continuing to talk about goals and growing in different uh, areas of our life. We talked about spiritual health, digital health, family health health. Uh, And today we're getting into a conversation on cultural health. We have a special guest speaker with us, Pastor Nick Maddox, who is a part of the BT staff. Uh, We're going to be talking about uh, how Christians should respond in light of the things that happen in culture and also looking at the context of black history. It's a great conversation. Check it out. So today's topic is going to be about uh, setting goals for our cultural health. Uh, So for the past couple of episodes, we've been looking at setting goals in different health aspects of our lives, whether it's our spiritual health, uh, digital health, family health. Uh, And so I'm I'm excited about going into the conversation about the culture and understanding how we as Christians should respond to the things happening around us, uh, because so much has happened in our culture recently, past year, past couple of years, even looking at that far. Uh, You look at the pandemic, you're looking at uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Movement, peaceful protests, riots taking place with George Floyd incident, uh, that and all that kind of bled into the sports scene with how they responded and reacted to everything taking place, uh, and athletes standing in solidarity with one another. Uh, and the common response is to look at these things from an outside perspective. Uh, and then give an inside opinion on what we think uh, about all those issues. And then uh, when we post on social media, it creates arguments. And so uh, what I'm excited about today is just having another conversation, uh, because even though those episodes may be done or maybe in the past, uh, they still need to be talked about. Uh, we still need to do some work to kind of get to a moment of, of having these uh, moments of listening to one another. And so I'm excited to have uh, my brother Nick here with us as a special guest today. Glad to uh, be here. So Nick, man, how are we doing, bro? Tell people how you're doing today. Man, I'm cold. Uh, (laughs) I'm cold trying to stay warm, but I am grateful uh, to have this opportunity Mm -hmm. to speak with my brother Danny. Yeah, and and if if you're watching right now and you don't know anything about BT Church, uh, Nick is one of our uh, uh, pastors on staff. Uh, He's associate pastor, but also is uh, on a heavy rotation as a teaching pastor. Uh, And one thing I love about the podcast is that this allows us to kind of dive deeper uh, than what we cannot do on a Sunday morning because we don't have that much time, right? Right. Sunday morning, you got 40 minutes max to preach a sermon. And so uh, there might be even things that you want to get into of the conversation, but you just kind of don't have the time to. And so I love that here we can have this uh, moment of having a conversation. Uh, And for me, I'm excited to simply uh, listen in and tune in. Uh, You know, right now we're also celebrating uh, Black History Month. And so I'm excited to kind of hear from your perspective and ways that you grew up uh, and what this month means to you. And so kind of starting off, uh, man, tell us about your upbringing. Uh, Maybe people don't know your story. They don't know where you grew up at. Uh, Maybe they don't understand or know where you uh, were called to ministry, how you met Jesus, what that uh, calling was like for you. So just kind of tell us about all that for you. Sure. So I'm I'm born and raised Washington D.C. Uh, born and raised, uh, my mom raised us. It was four of us, me mm. and my three sisters, and uh, we would be in church um, every Sunday, um, and not just one service, but Sunday was for church. Yeah. Um, and so I just grew up having a great appreciation for the church and. Uh, a lot of my mentors and, and father figures were in the church. They were the deacons of the church, and they 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 helped uh, mentor me, lead me, guide me. Um, around the age of nine is when uh, I knew I needed to, you know, respond to the gospel. Back mm. then, you know, we, we had altar call. We have altar call here at BT, but back then you wanted to respond. You had to walk down the, you know, the yeah. middle aisle. Uh, give the preacher your hand, give God your heart. And uh, that, that's what I did at nine, got baptized. And then just grew up. Um, after that, uh, went to college in North Carolina. So at, at 17, went to college in North Carolina to a historically black college and university, North Carolina Central University, um, which was which was started um, as a university, but also, you know, a, a, a religious training school. Mm. Um, but became a, a liberal arts college there. Met my wife, hey. who is from the Valley. And uh, after college, we moved to the Valley. Um, college is also where I accepted my call into gospel ministry. Mm. Um, you know, you just just couldn't fight it anymore. And, um, you know, at 19, I knew that I would be doing something 
uh, in the church, yeah. serving God some way, somehow, for the rest of my life. That's and, good. And it's been, you know, one of the greatest honors of my life to do it. Man, that's awesome. Uh, how long have you guys been married? We have been married for 15 years. It will be 16 years this August. Oh, amen. Praise God. That's so good. Love that, man. Uh, I want to transition to talking about uh, Black History Month. Sure. Uh, what does this month mean for you, uh, and why do you think it's important to pause, reflect on the history uh, of our black brothers and sisters? So b- growing up in, in public school in D.C., you know, Black History Month was one of my favorite mm. times of the year, just hearing about uh, all of the advances and all of the ways that um, – you know, my ancestors kind of, you know, to to borrow from the church, made a way out of no way, mm. which which is awesome. Um, and so, uh, you know, 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 knowing about the origins of Black History Month that, that started with uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson and also uh, minister uh, Jesse Moreland um, in 1926, uh, those two gentlemen had an organization and um, what they – they started with uh, Negro History Week. Mm. So at first we just had a week. <laughs> <laughs> also in February? Also in February. Okay. Um, and they, they did that. They did it in February because that is the birth month of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. But they did that week because they wanted to begin to change the narrative of, uh, you know, the plight of African-Americans in in this country. They mm-hmm. wanted to talk about the advances in scholarship and the advances yeah. in science. And so that that's kind of how it, that was the reason for doing that. And then in the 70s, um, it, it turned into Black History Month. Mm-hmm. And so I love it um, for that cultural reason. Theologically, why I love it is because, you know, it, it takes me back to the beginning. So uh, God, in the beginning, he tells Adam and Eve to uh, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, take dominion of it. Well, at that time, they were in the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. Eden was the only place that was that that was orderly. So Adam and Eve were supposed to take this mandate and extend Eden into some grimy places, into yeah. some wild places. And so to, to kind of tame the, the world that they were in and to me black history month is is kind of taking that creation mandate serious to be fruitful multiply yeah take the earth have dominion over it subdue it and so when you hear about guys like george washington carver you know when you hear guys like benjamin banneker that they they took dominion they were fruitful in in where they were and they did some amazing things, you know. You 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 hear about Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. They they were able to do some amazing things, and and uh, and I I just I just have always been encouraged by that. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and, and just for me personally, you know, in light of um, you know episodes and events that have taken place recently that we'll kind of get into with our culture, uh, it's kind of caused me to uh, just to try to understand, to be a reader, to to learn a little bit. Uh, so I've I've uh, sought out reading different books uh, about uh, black culture, black theology. Uh, you know, I like that you kind of went to a theological perspective of that. Um, and one thing that uh, you know I've learned, you know, in my reading is uh, just the, the the black people's loving of the story of the Book of Exodus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and man, I'd love to just kind of hear your thoughts on that. Just that that liberation, um, you know, movement type of thing for them. Yeah, and so uh, it's funny that you bring that up because you know. Um, one of the major, kind of one of the major um, barriers to evangelism in the African American community is that um, Christianity is the white man's religion. Mm, yeah, and so <clears throat> you know you got to keep fighting that, right? Um, number one is is not accurate mm-hmm. um, because also black history is church history. Church history is That's black right. history. Yeah. You look at origin and. Cyril of Alexandria and Augustine and, you know, many others. So, um, but that Exodus story, the fact that God hears the cries of his people, Mm -hmm. God sends somebody down to liberate. God does the heavy lifting and is not just concerned about our souls, 
and the sweet by and by, but God is concerned about our bodies and the here and now that resonated, um, that resonated with African Americans and, and, you know, crazy enough, Exodus was what the slave masters ripped out of the Bible. Mm, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, just just hearing the word of God really um, become a light to people's path, right? Um, it, it's an amazing thing mm. be, because it, it just brings to mind the truth of the word. The word of God is living and active. And so that tells me that whatever situation I find myself in, the word of God uh, has an answer. The word of God has hope. And, and, and more importantly, the word of God points to, to Jesus, who, who is the ultimate liberator, who is the right. ultimate hope giver, life giver. So, yeah. So, yeah. That's good, man. Uh, and so I want to get into uh, just topics of culture, you mm -hmm. know, because we're talking about cultural health. Uh, and really the focus that I would love to kind of get out of this for, for anybody tuning in, um, especially if you're watching and you're a believer of Christ, you're a Christian, is is what should our response be when we see different things happening in our culture? Uh, you know, whether it's related to, to black people or not, it can be related to, uh, you know, a, a certain figure participating in immorality or whatever the case. And we'll kind of talk about those sort of things. But um, but looking back a couple of years ago, uh, you know, I'm a big football fan, love yeah. football, like a die hard Tom Brady fan. Everybody knows it. Uh, amen. He's a goat. Um, <laughs> and so watch football religiously. Uh, on September 1st, 2016, Colin Kaepernick took a knee at the start of a football game during the national anthem. Uh, that scene brought about a wide range of mm -hmm. thoughts um, and really a, a wide range of posts and opinions, uh, but also brought about a lot of conversations in our culture uh, that are still talked about today. Um, and so just kind of initially, when you first saw that, what were your thoughts? So when I first saw it, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't turned off by it. I wasn't offended by it. Um, you know, I remember uh, seeing, you know, from history, you know, uh, John Carlos, you know, the the, the U.S. track team. They mm -hmm. they protested during the national anthem. I, you know, I grew up knowing about yeah. uh, stuff like that. So. My initial thought was, okay, why is this brother doing that? You know, uh, because that he's trying to bring attention to something. So that was my thinking. Like, what is he trying to bring attention to? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you know, kind of after that, it took a, it took on a life of its own, right? Um, and so then I started to read about why he was kneeling. And then you got to hear about, yeah. you know, how he kind of connected with uh, the former soldier and and right. and how they reached and understand. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I was like, man, like, okay, even though he's trying to communicate this message and he's saying this this way, he's still open. Like Colin Kaepernick is still open to hearing what this soldier had to say, mm -hmm. you know. Nate Boyer, I think, was that Nate Boyer, yeah, 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 thank you. You know, why are we focusing so much on his demonstration and why aren't we trying to understand why he's doing what he did? Yeah, that's good. Because uh, the other thought I have, too, is, like, I think a lot of people were upset um, – the moment that he took a knee, you know what I mean? And they're like, why, why then, you know, why the demonstration idea? Uh, but then, I mean, everybody uses their platform to, yeah, to share their opinion. Sure. Uh, and he was using his platform at that moment. Uh, and Matt, from there, it, it, you know, it kind of brought up a wide range of stuff. And not to cut you off, but like you read the old Testament and the prophets engaged in public protest. Yeah. I mean, you you know, you look at Ezekiel and some some of the other ones how how they did it, and so you know, it's that is something that's not foreign to Scripture, mm -hmm. you know. And so, I was just like, well, why is he doing this? What what is he trying to draw attention to? Yeah. You know, and that's a good way of seeing it because a lot of times we, it's even similar to to reading a news headline. Uh, we see the initial thing and then we react. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We see the headline and we react without even reading what the journalist has to say. Right, right. <laughs> and they want to grab your attention. And so for Kaepernick, you know, we saw that moment and 
maybe rather than asking the question why, we said, you know, what is he doing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, rather than why is he doing that? Uh, and then you just think about recently, you know, last year in May, George Floyd passed away, sparked a countrywide uh, expansion of either riots or peaceful protests. Uh, from their phrase, Black Lives Matter, which was created in, in 2013, came into light really again widely in our culture yeah. uh, to, you know, maybe the, the person who's not following that storyline. Uh, now everyone's reading about it, seeing about it, you know, posting about it. Um, and so I want to talk about that for a minute. Uh, I feel like it definitely stirs people differently when they hear that phrase, Black Lives Matter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe stir something inside when they hear that. Um, and then we even get the response, well, like, all lives matter, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and so... Um, Christians uh, maybe even shouldn't be supporting the organization, and we kind of hear about those things as well. Uh, and so, initially, what what is the difference between the organization and the movement uh, type of thing? Um, and then, why is it important to say Black Lives Matter versus the phrase All Lives Matter? Okay, that's good, and that, man, that's that's a lot. It is just in those. Yeah. I would say, um, <clears throat> here's what I would say. I would say the Black Lives Matter movement is something that is not new. Um, you know, you got Ida B. Wells. Right. Uh, when she was writing about lynching, she was communicating Black Lives Matter. Um, you got, you know, Dr. King during the Civil Rights Movement and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. They were communicating Black Lives Matter. When you know, And so t to me, the movement is not new. Mm -hmm. It it is taken on uh it, it is it is it is taking on maybe a new relevance in this generation. But in my opinion, the Black Lives Matter movement has has been in this country and been in the church for you know a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, now, the Black Lives Matter organization, um, you know, they want to um, they want to bring attention to, you know, injustices and bring attention to um, the mistreatment of of black people in this country. And that is a noble thing. The Black Lives Matter organization is not a Christian organization. They make no bones about it. Right. Um, and here's my thing. They don't need to be a Christian organization. You know, that 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 is, you know, that is their organization's right mm -hmm. to do that. Um, I feel like as Christians and in theology, you know, we talk about general revelation and special revelation, mm -hmm. right? As as a Christian, I can get behind the statement Black Lives Matter. As a Christian, I can get behind the movement Black Lives Matter um, be, because it's true. Um, right. You know what I mean? It's true. Um, now, when somebody says, well, what about all lives matter? Well, I would say, okay, yes. Well, if all lives matter, then black lives mm -hmm. must matter, and I'm glad we agree. <laughs> you know, I mean, what, yeah. what, you know, right. that type thing. Um, they, they don't have to cancel each other out. Okay. But if you say all lives matter and you are not expressing concern for the horrific, yeah. you know, the horrific video that we saw of, you know, the officer with his knee on George Floyd's mm -hmm. neck. I mean, just in an inhumane way, just to discount, oh, well, all lives matter. Well, that's actually, that hasn't been the, that hasn't been what is manifested in this country, if we're honest. Mm -hmm. um, all lives haven't mattered. And so, uh, you know, that that's just my take on it. You know, the, the the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement is not new. Yeah. Um, you know, we we have seen that down through history. Now the organization, it is the organization. I, I, I don't expect it. I'm like the Apostle Paul, you know, um what use do I have to judge those outside of the church? Mm -hmm. Like, I ain't they not a Christian organization? Okay. Well what is the Christian church doing to communicate Black Lives Matter? That's that's a better mm -hmm. question, you know? Yeah, if an unchristian organization is doing more for black lives than the church is, sure. then well, we, something's got to be done. <laughs> something got to be done. And that's yeah. what I'm saying. Well, let's let's ask that question Yeah, because that's our business. You know, let's not mind Black Lives Matter organization business. What, well, let's turn it on to the church. Okay, you don't agree with how they're doing, what they're doing, and where they go. Okay, 
what we gonna do? Yeah, I love that. That's good. Uh, and so it's kind of kind of now building off of that, uh, kind of leads into what I want to talk about next. Um, a lot of times what happens when we see these things, see these episodes uh, that happen in our culture, uh, not even always referencing, you know, uh, something that happened with Black Lives Matter, but even uh, within the church, within mm-hmm. um, professed Christians uh, who do something immoral, practice immoral immorality, someone falls and, uh, you know, by doing something, uh, something wrong and immoral. Uh, then they're often canceled by culture. And yeah. that's a big phrase right now in our culture is is the cancel culture. Is if I tweeted something in high school, you know, 10 years ago, and somebody finds that tweet, um, and it was, you know, either minorly or massively something immoral, yeah. um, then me as a pastor, you know, I, I could lose my job tomorrow type of thing. Like yep. That's the culture we live in. Uh, that's we why might I might lose our job over this. I deleted my Twitter <laughs> no, page. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> and so it was just funny. I actually saw, uh, you know, whenever Avengers was a, a big deal, uh, I think it was like a Babylon Bee post or something like that. And they were like, uh, the Avengers beat Thanos by resurfacing old tweet. <laughs> 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 so it's just, uh, that's the culture we live in, though, is we, is we, is we, Somebody does something, make a mistake, whatever, or maybe it's even a lifestyle that, sure. that, that resurfaced or came to light, uh, got exposed. Uh, then that person is canceled, you know. And recently, with with lights of pastors, uh, you have Carl Lentz, you have Ravi Zacharias, yes. uh, which very difficult stories to read about. Yes. Um, and so, uh, and then going back throughout culture history. Um, but I want to start with this question: When it comes to pastors and authors, um, would you read a book? Okay, from someone who is being culturally canceled right now, let's say the Carl Lentz's, the Ravi Zacharias. Okay. Um, and then how should we as Christians respond to the cancel culture movement right now? That was a good question, man. Good gracious. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we talking about cultural health. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you familiar with uh, Richard Wagner? Mm-hmm. Okay. Richard Wagner wrote the uh, Here Comes the Bride song. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. I think that's his name. Yeah. It's it's like weddings nowadays. Like people don't use that. They use like a you know a hipster song or sure. Phil Wickham or something like sure. that. Sure. Well, that well, so Richard Richard Wagner he was uh, he had some negative views against Jews. Mm. So you know historically you would rarely hear that song. Almost never hear that song played um, at a Jewish wedding. Yeah. Because of his his thoughts back. That's been years ago, though. Like, what what I'm saying is this. When people have ideas or behaviors or do something or do things that that are, you know, genuinely, and I don't even know if that's the right term, but that, that are harmful and detrimental and, you know, really destructive, they forfeit the right to set the terms, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm, I'm just, you know, and so, you know, Wagner, you know, even though he wrote that beautiful, he wrote that beautiful song, dun, 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 mm. I mean, it was great, <laughs> right? But when you have those views, well, even though you made that right, you, you, you kind of forfeit your influence, yeah. right? And so here's my thing on cancel culture. I've said it in a sermon. No Christian should be comfortable in a cancel culture because we haven't been canceled right. ourselves by God. We haven't been. And so, yes, we need to be gracious, but but here's another truth. People remember the last thing you did. Mm. <laughs> I'm just, you know, that's just real. And when I forfeit my influence through my own behavior, through my own destructive ideas, words, behavior, attitudes, I do forfeit some of my, I, I forfeit my influence. I for, And so, you know, what I would say, you know, with Ravi Zacharias, I would never recommend a Ravi Zacharias mm-hmm. book to someone who's been sexually abused, especially knowing what has come out, and you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so people are like, oh, well, that's cancel culture. But that's common sense. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that is common sense, you know? Um, another thing, when I look at Scripture, when you have been given opportunities and grace, 
there comes a point to when you don't know if you're going to get another chance. Yeah. That's just real. And my mind goes back to uh, my mind goes back to King Saul and uh, the prophet Samuel when when Saul is told to uh, take out the Amalekites and he doesn't. He mm-hmm. said, I, you know, I want to do my own thing and he saves him. And then uh, Saul comes in and says, hey, man, you ain't do what God told you to do. And tonight the kingdom has been ripped from you. Like basically, in other words, Saul, you're now canceled as king. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I'm going to raise up somebody else. And so Saul, in failing to do that, well, he forfeited his influence. Yeah. And his. And even though, you know, he was a king, even though he prophesied, he did some great things, people remember the last thing you did. And, and uh, it's unfortunate. But, you know, that's why I, you know, I pray every day, God, you know, Jesus keep me near the cross, mm-hmm. like really to borrow from the church because, you know, I'm like Paul. I, I, I agree with Paul. You know, I train myself so that, you know, lest I minister to others and I, I myself be disqualified. Like yeah. that, that's the, t- that's that type thing, you know. And, and I do, I do believe that we love mercy mm-hmm. when we need it, but we don't love mercy when we have to give it. Yeah. I, I I believe that, but it, you know I just gotta say, and this might get me in trouble, but you know I've seen people be canceled in the church for less. Hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, I just you know I just leave it at that. I ain't gonna I ain't gonna say no name, but like there's a there's a prominent preacher who used to be preaching everywhere. I mean, at mm. a lot of the big conferences. Well, he started speaking out on racial injustice and, and all of this other stuff. Well, guess what? I don't see him as much no more. Mm. Is that cancel culture? I don't know. Yeah. They're not on the list. They're not on it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the phone stopped ringing. Yeah. You know, is yeah. that is that cancel culture? Yeah. You know, so. And, and it's interesting, too, because you see, like, the culture responds to stuff that happens. Mm-hmm. They either going to cancel somebody or then you look at, like, the sports world where they're now um, extremely proactive about the phrases they're using, mm-hmm. you know, putting it on a football field, in the back of a helmet, on a jersey, all this sure. stuff. So, so culture responds to what's happening in culture. Um, and, and my hope is that the church responds as well. And then the church has to respond well, you know, uh, and, and, you know, in the way that uh, Jesus would love well. You know, you think about the woman at the at, calling adultery, you know, mm-hmm. she was about to be canceled. And then, like you said, like, you know, Jesus extends that mercy to us anyway. Yes. Uh, you know, woman at the well, you, you've had five husbands. You yeah. know? Uh, but and I'm, even I'm, the, with, with the woman caught in the very act of adultery, and I'm so glad you brought that up. She was getting ready to be canceled. Mm-hmm. Jesus steps in. He restores her. And he says, "Go and sin no more." Right. That it there's a virtuous moral transformation mm-hmm. that has to be yeah. at the foundation of who we are. Like you know, like we've got to start even in the church. Like we've got to start valuing faithfulness over success. Yeah, we just have to. Yeah, I mean that's that's good. You know, we we got to start doing that. We've we've got to value character. And we've got to continue. I love uh, uh, Pastor Thorne's book, you know, Note to Self. It's mm-hmm. about preaching the gospel to yourself. We've got to preach the gospel to ourselves, mm-hmm. uh, you know. But, yeah, that was a good, that's a good and question. And I think, too, man. like even just uh, personally, man, like how, how do we respond at an individual level? Because it breaks my heart when I see these, you know, the Carl Lances, the Robbie oh, right. It's It's hard to read those stories. Um Man, you, we have to allow people to disciple us no matter what our platform is. Exactly. And it's and I think once we get to the point of of I'm good and we don't have anybody close to us, it's so dangerous. Take heed lest ye fall, yeah. right? Like that's that's if any man thinks he stands, take heed yes lest ye fall. It's good, man. Appreciate you, bro. Good insight. A uh, couple more questions. Uh, I've been reading, or I just finished uh, Color Compromise, Jamar, Jamar Tisby. Uh, one of the main things he focused on is bringing to light the history of how uh, African Americans were treated in our country during the Civil War era uh, and up to the rights of the, of the Civil Rights Movement uh, to Martin Luther King, uh, which, you know, you think about wasn't that long ago. Not at all. Um, 
And and in in his writing, he uses this phrase that Christians or, or the church for so long had a passive complicity to slavery and to racism towards African Americans. And and that phrase kept it just stood out to me a lot. Passive complicity. Uh, so maybe you know it's the idea that uh, they're not uh, vocal about it, but they're also not saying anything about it type right. of thing. Um, and so as the church, how can we grow? in this and not fall into passive complicity. Uh, you know, one thing that you and I were talking about as we're preparing for this podcast is um, sometimes it depends where you live and and, and who you're ministering to. And, yeah. and you cannot have this passive complicity depending on, you know, who's in front of you type of thing. Uh, so we just kind of love to get into that conversation uh, of what passive complicity maybe looks like uh, and how do we grow as a church and, and not falling into that. Sure, man. That was, I mean, that was, that was a sticky. So, um, glad you're reading that book and 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 other things and and from history like this is not a new problem mm -hmm. like dr martin luther king's letter from a birmingham jail was addressing that very thing right. um you know one of the things that jesus said in the sermon on the mount is this blessed are the peacemakers right um and he said blessed are the peacemakers why you know uh why why blessed are the peacemakers well Blessed are the peacemakers for, what is it, they shall see God? Is that what it says? Right? Mm. Right? Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall see God. Well, that's important, right? So we should value peace. But if blessed are the peacemakers uh, for, for they shall see God or be the sons of God, then God values truth. You know, and so what I, I take that to mean this, I can't be a peacemaker if I'm not willing to be a truth teller. Mm. And what that means is, you know, I have to be grounded in the scriptures. I have to have a relationship with God for myself. I have to be led by the spirit and not by my denomination. I have to be led by the mm. spirit and not my tribe. Because what will happen is when I see something or when something rises up, you know, I'm tempted not to tell the truth now because of my tribe or yeah. you, you you feel what I'm saying or, you know, my, my clique or my crew. And we will never achieve reconciliation without telling the truth about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I say that all the time and people are like, well, tell the truth about what? Well, We've got to tell the truth about, you know, how white supremacy has impacted the church in America and U.S. history. You got to, got to be willing to tell the truth about that, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, I know it may rub some people the wrong way. We got to be willing to tell the truth about that. We also have to be willing to tell the truth about how irresponsibility and, you know, uh, riotous living and a disregard for moral virtue. We've got to talk about how that has degraded our culture. Mm. We got to be willing to tell the truth about that. And it's not racist to point that out. You see what I'm saying? It's not like we have to be willing to tell the truth because if we're peacemakers and we're going to see God, uh, we got to be truth tellers. Mm. And so courageous Christianity looks like telling the truth when everybody else, you know, mm. don't want you to, yeah, um, you know, I, I, that's what I think, you know, that's what I believe. That's good. Uh, and I think about this phrase, passive complicity, you know, um, past Sunday, um, mm -hmm. you know, walking through the, the gospel of Luke right now on Sunday mornings as the church is BT. And we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a story of people being passive to somebody in need. Right. Uh, rather than being active. And, and I know that it's, you know, depending on where you live and your, your pastor, you're ministering somewhere, you're ministering in an urban city context, people want to know what you think. Um, and so then that you can get into that conversation too. Do pastors need to share every bit of opinion or every bit of thought that they have when they see something take place? Um, you know, how do we share that? What platforms, like, what does that look like? Uh, but even Christians, you know, like I think people want to know what Christians think about stuff. Yeah. Um, and people listen to what Christians are saying or Christians are posting. Um, and so as Christians, we have to be very careful with how we are doing that and what we are saying. We do. And I've learned this. Yeah. And, and just a correction is blessed are the people, peacemakers. They should be called sons of God. Mm -hmm. So that's and if I'm a son of God, I got to be. Yeah, I got to be a lover of truth. I got to be a truth teller. Yeah. Right. 
Um, here's what I know as a pastor. I'm a pastor. I'm not an economist. I'm not a sociologist. I love history, but I'm not a trained historian. Mm -hmm. I'm not a licensed mental health professional. So I say all that to say this, like, I have a whole lot of opinions on a whole lot of stuff. Right. But I try to pick, I try to pick, you know, when I say what I say. Mm -hmm. Is that Does that make sense? Yeah. Because I would, here's another thing that I know. I'm not Facebook's pastor. You know, like, mm -hmm. this is fruitful. What, what we do at BT and, 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 and this circle of influence that God has given me, I value this a whole lot, you know. And so I say a whole lot of stuff in these settings mm -hmm. than I do on social media yeah. because I do say some stuff on social media too, and, it, you know, it, it, it gets sticky sometimes. <laughs> But I say much more here in our in my local context, mm -hmm. and I think, um, you know, just that that comfortable, complicit Christianity has to be open to what's going on uh, in the local context. Mm -hmm. And I say that because, hey, our issues here may not be the issues that happen in Minnesota with George Floyd, right. but guess what? We got issues here in our community that that Christians need to raise their voice and mm -hmm. speak up about. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And no, I'm not asking you to go out here and march for Black Lives Matter and all. I ain't actually, I'm not asking you to do that, but but like you said, what is God opening your eyes to in your own community mm -hmm. that you need to rise up and be a voice for the voiceless or you need to rise up and speak truth in that area there. And so that's one of the things I, I feel like I've been called to do. Um, and I, I try to do that, you know. Uh, I want to end with with this. Um, what's like one challenge or one lot of encouragement that you can encourage anybody listening um, to do this in light of Black Lives Matter, whether it's check out this documentary, check out this resource, read this book, do something, have a conversation with somebody. Uh, what's like, just like here, try, try this or try these things that you would encourage people to do. Okay. Uh, man, that's a lot. Oh, I would say, um, first read the Bible, <laughs> you know, um, I would say read the Bible because when you read the story of scripture, man, it's hard to walk away saying, oh, man, God is passive. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, when you yeah. read the Bible, like, that's hard. Like, you, for God so passively loved yeah, the world. Yeah, you know, you like, no, for God so loved the world that he gave his only yeah. God. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, in this, the love of God is made manifest. Like, you know, we God does stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, God is active. active. He's living. Yeah. God values diversity. You read the scriptures. It's it's you read the scriptures, it's hard to walk away thinking, oh, God only loved white people or God only loved black people. No, he has a desire for the nations. Mm -hmm. Like so, honestly, and I'm not just saying that yeah. as the Sunday school answer, read the Bible and read it. You know? Mm -hmm. And 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 understand that when you read it, you're gonna read it with an American lens mm -hmm. that is not gospel. You know, I said this in the pulpit that the, the Bible is without error, but my interpretation and my application is not yeah. without error. So read the Bible. Another thing I would say, <laughs> specifically as it relates to uh, black people in this country, there are so many good documentaries out there. Um, one is by Henry Louis Gates called Many Rivers to Cross. Um, fascinating, fascinating documentary very good and the reason why I say look at that and some people may you know um why why are you just talking about black issues well that's what specifically was your <laughs> yeah, it's a black history month yeah, the, podcast, so that was so, yeah. okay so that's what yeah. you said so that's why I'm bringing it right, up yeah. well what about Hispanics well yes. in October yeah. Hispanic history month I think that's when it is um we'll do something then oh, that's good I mean it's you you do it so <laughs> um but but I would say 
Look at that documentary, Many Rivers to Cross. And the reason why I say that is this. Because as Christians, we are missionaries wherever we are. Mm-hmm. And you have to use what you have where you are. You got to do what you can with what you have where you are. No effective missionary just goes on the mission mm-hmm. field without trying to understand right. the context yeah. where they're ministering. And so, you know, we have actual Christians that want to talk about re- reconciliation, want to pursue it, but they don't know the history. Mm-hmm. They they, they want to talk about reconciliation and they want to pursue it, but, you know, they, they're, they're ignorant of, you know, how we got here. It, um, it's Paul and Athens. It's... I've seen how y'all worship. Yes. Paul is observing the culture. Yes. And I feel like that's one thing that maybe we fail to do is, is we fail to observe the culture. Yes. Uh, and so, um, man, love it. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, man. Good conversation, bro. Yeah, man. My bad. I messed up on the uh, Sermon on the Mount thing. Oh, you're good. Uh, so last question. Goat. Uh, NBA. Okay. LeBron or Jordan and why LeBron? Okay. Jordan, I'm not. I'm not saying he the goat. <laughs> he 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 close though. <laughs> Jordan had a killer instinct mm-hmm. that is just crazy. Um, but I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to not say LeBron. I'm not going to say Jordan. I'm about to mess everybody up and go <laughs> old school. And here's here's why. We keep talking about goats, but you got to talk about Bill Russell, mm. man. He got more rings than fingers. <laughs> what Bill Russell did was, I mean, all of these guys changed the game, yeah. but Bill Russell literally took the game up. Mm. You know what I mean? And so without Russell... Jordan is not Air Jordan because the game wasn't up. I mean, they would do, 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 do. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? They just, <laughs> you feel yeah. me? Um, so we got to put some more respect on Bill Russell's name. Give him his flowers while he's still here. We got to put some respect on his name. <laughs> Bill Russell, the GOAT, man. He got more rings than fingers if we talking about championships championships yeah. and all. And for what he actually did with the game and taking the game up. That's good. You know? I like it. But I love LeBron, though. I he's, still going. he's still going. He's still going. He's still, he's still, going. Going. He's still, still here. He's the MVP of the league every year. Right. It's LeBron versus who for MVP. Yeah, matter. Giannis ain't been no MVP. <laughs> man. All right, man. Appreciate your time, thank bro. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your wisdom. And, uh, man, I hope that we get to do this conversation again. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, praying for you, family, your ministry. Love that I get to be a part of it and see it uh, and cheer you on in the crowd. So love you, bro. Man, it's one of the greatest honors in my life to, to serve God's church and specifically to serve at BT with you, man. I'm serious. I'm serious. All right.